Welcome to our next episode of the Five Moments of Need Performance Matters series. This is Bob Mosier, one of the many co-hosts you'll meet throughout this series. So friends, are you trying to learn more about the five moments of need? Maybe how to design for them, implement for them, measure them, and even sell them as an approach to your enterprise. Well, in the Performance Matters series, we will help you better understand the theory and best practices behind this powerful methodology and offer proven ways to put the five moments of need into practice. Welcome back to another episode of the Performance Matters podcast series. Bob Mosier here, one of your co-hosts throughout this series. So appreciate all of you that tune in. We're well into our 64th or 5th episode over the years. Uh, we hope they're helpful. If not, or if they are, let us know. We'd appreciate feedback uh, and how we can do them better and topics that might be helpful. Today, I am joined by two of my uh, heroes in life, my wonderful colleagues that I'm blessed to work with on a daily basis, Dr. Khan Godfordson and Sue Reber. Welcome. Thank you. Great always to be here with Sue and you. I agree. Great to be here with both of you. <laughs> yeah, and they're both brilliant, not only friends and, and learning designers, but particularly in the field of five moments. Obviously, we know Khan's pedigree around that and being the pioneer. And Sue's just a remarkable, remarkable designer, a senior analyst in this area. So this is an interesting one to take us into because this sort of actually jumped out of a post on LinkedIn. Uh, many of you know that I, I kind of have a pet peeve around vocabulary and get on those quite a bit in my posts and other things. And I had brought up this idea of a digital coach relative to five moments, relative to workflow learning. Got a little pushback on the brand, but more importantly, got some pushback on, you know, what is this thing? Why, why is it so important? Um, don't we do it already with SharePoint? A whole bunch of things came up. So we decided that we'd go take a deeper dive with these two experts uh, into exactly why we have found anyway, relative to five moments in our work, and workflow learning, that this is really a differentiator. It's kind of a critical pivot in uh, both the implementation of effectively doing this, but also uh, in designing things that we do and what and what we design first. So friends, let me get let me get to this idea about branding for a second. You know, Glor we, we often talk about Gloria Geary, 1991, Electronic Performance Support Systems, remarkable uh, landmark book, in our opinion, by all means, look it up and read it if you can get it. And she references performance support. And obviously the book is called Electronic Performance Support, EPSS, which was a brand in our industry forever. Like I said, we are sensitive to that. But this whole idea about calling it a digital coach, if you two wouldn't mind, why and where did it come from? Why in this case might a rebrand be warranted? And how has it helped in what we've seen in our work with working with folks? As you know, Bob and, and Sue, Goodness, we've been talking about an EPSS and how it is a vital tool in the performance support arsenal and the discipline of performance support. The challenge has been that the business, the lines of business, have really struggled to grasp something called an EPSS. And so we've worked to try to find a way where people who are not grounded in Gloria's work and have a history on the learning side could really relate to what a, an EPSS does. And the, the term digital coach has surfaced and worked for us. We see other labels that organizations use, uh, but the notion of a digital coach seems to have worked a lot better for us in describing what it is that we want to do with this very powerful tool. I think one of the difficulties came because in business, there are all kinds of acronyms all over the place. Mm. <laughs> and so EPSS, might that might have started out okay, but then there was embedded performance support systems, and it just all became very confusing. And so I feel like changing it up and calling it a digital coach helps really to focus and it's not just another acronym that I have to try to keep track of. It, it, it brings up a picture for you of what it is. I think it speaks to a principle of embeddedness and, and the power of this thing to your point, Con. I mean, people want a digital coach. They don't necessarily want an EPSS. They want, and, and, and so from branding perspective, and Con mentioned one, a, a lot of our, our clients, those we work with, don't even, they don't use a digital coach. They 
adopt the language of the business and come up with something. But principally, that's why it is what it is, because it, it, it is native to the work. It's embedded in the work and therefore being branded, frankly, uh, in the context of the work is big. So frankly, we're not married to Digital Coach, personally. Uh, we use it all uh, quite a bit. And, and to Khan's point, it breaks the seal for us with a lot of clients. But I think the message here is that unlike we and us inflicting our stuff on others, it, it, as we have for years, maybe from a training perspective, this is really one that comes from the user back. And they'll use what sounds, looks, feels appropriate and, and native. So that one's resonated. So how about this? You know, you, you've been a designer in the five moments forever. Why is this so pivotal to that methodology? Why, why is it and, and how has it been a pivot for you? Yeah, because it, it really supports the entire spectrum of learning needs a digital coach does. Whereas training, I come from the training world, and that's really supporting when you need to learn something new or when you need to learn something more. But once you get back to work and you need to do something or something goes wrong or you need, you know, you need to troubleshoot it or something changes, then what do you do? You don't want to go back into a classroom and take another class that just pulls you away for longer. And frankly, you don't really need that most of the time. So I think it fits just beautifully into the methodology. It allows us to really be targeted during training on things that require training and allow us to support people throughout the entire learning life cycle, whatever their learning needs might be. You know, um, we're working with a client right now. They said to us, uh, we, have, we have a digital coach and uh, said, so what is it? And they described an online help system for software. And as we looked at it, it was a very flat system. It was far from what Gloria Geary described as a digital coach. As a matter of fact, she made a clear distinction between online help and what she called an EPSS or what we're calling a digital coach. So it's one thing to call something a digital coach, it's, but what we have to define is what is the functionality that makes it a digital coach? And that's where methodology comes in. You know, a digital coach needs to deliver just what you need at the moment of need and orchestrate all of the resources that you have to accommodate all five moments of need in the flow of work. So the moment of apply, you've got to be able to get to the steps of things and uh, follow those steps. Solve, you've got to get to FAQs. We have so many different kinds of performance support tools and templates and resources that a digital coach orchestrates those in a systematic way. And method, the five moments of need methodology is a, uh, has a clear uh, prescription for how we orchestrate those resources to enable effective performance on the job. So it's a vital. It, without that, uh, you may think you have a digital coach, but it won't do what a digital coach needs to do. You know, and Sue, I want to run at your point about, you know, design and methodology is that a big pivot for me, you guys, was Khan's always said, design for the moment of apply first. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> I mean, wh what's the deliverable? I, I always knew how to make a class. I was trained how to design e-learning. Um, new and more, Sue, as you said, but when you pivot on apply, you have to have something that you that you end up with, and it is a digital coach. You build from the digital coach back, but that's a huge pivot for L&D, candidly. We talk in terms of course, chapter, lesson, curriculum, mm -hmm. you know, ILT, VILT, e-learning. Those are, those are, I think, predetermined and predisposed when we walk into analysis, whether we say them or not. Um, yeah. this, is, this is a very different pivot, Sue, isn't it, to, to, in the methodology that we designed for many of us, a very different deliverable that we may have never have actually even designed for before. Absolutely. And it does require changing your thinking because you really do have to be focused on what do people need to do at the moment of apply and what support do they need in order to do it. And then you back into the training and only add to the training those elements that are critical for the training side of things right. because the content is 
fundamentally embedded into that digital coach that you bring into the classroom and then you wrap around it the practice activities and, and the other things that you do in training. Let me run into something you always say. It kind of segues to our next question is, we often think of an EPSS very job aid-like or resource only like. We can put training in there. Part of our pyramid, part of our design is to link out to an e-learning, link out to a video, link yeah. out to an instructional, link out to a coach, if you can do that. So friends, can a digital coach replace the classroom? Can a digital coach stand alone? Of course, the answer to that is yes. As long as the skills that you're supporting don't require people to stop work to learn. We know that about half of what is in a formal training on the average can be pushed into the flow of work where a digital coach can actually facilitate learning while working, right? But there are those skills, those tasks where the critical impact of failure demands that we take time and have people stop their work and we focus in on those critical impact of failure skill sets that need to be addressed. The awesome thing about it too is that when you do that, you have more time in the classroom to actually focus on those things that people need to be able to practice in a safe environment to make sure that they know what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's interesting because it can stand alone, but does it often in our work? Oh, we always find a blend, right, Bob? And that blend is where you've got that portion that can be learned in the flow of work with the help of a digital coach. But then you have those areas that you need to target, those skills that you need to target, where the critical impact of failure is significant to catastrophic. You still need that support as they transition into the flow of work. So a digital coach is needed for all training, but it can, as you mentioned, Sue, it can lift the burden of the classroom, of the formal learnings, what, whatever form that takes, by pushing into the workflow those skills that people can learn safely on their own using a digital coach exclusively and give you more time and room in the training side of things to truly focus on methodology that matters, that ensures that people can actually master those critical impact of failure skills. Well, so you, you mentioned targeted training earlier, right? That we get, yes. we get that as a deliverable of the methodology. Mm -hmm. Can you take us a little bit deeper into that and even how you might intentionally use the tool in support of that when it comes yeah. to instruction? Yeah, so I think that's one place where people struggle too, especially when I'm thinking about traditional learning design. They're thinking about the classroom and they're thinking, okay, so I'm going to design my digital coach over here and then I'm going to design my training. And they really don't see them as integrated, but really they are integrated and you should be using that digital coach in the training. So the point is at the end of the training, not only have they had time to practice those critical things that they needed to practice, but they also know where they need to go for support when they are at the moment of apply, where they can find the information that they need to do their job. I love that. You know, it is a teach to fish approach, right? Not, not feed them one. And, and you're right. It takes the burden off of all that content that I feared as an instructor that I had to cover every single time, whether the stu students are ready for it or not, because I was the one hit wonder. And if they didn't get it with me, they never got it again. And so this, this, this point about covering things changed dramatically for me when I saw my first digital coach, because I basically said, it's all covered there. It's yeah. all covered there. Now, when I get in class, I can emphasize to Khan's point and go deeper in certain things and practice and fail others. But I am no longer the end all of content and, and yeah. the guide that takes people through an outline. I, I'm giving them and teaching them how to use everything they'll ever need to know in a way that it's covered when they're working. Yeah, you know, our view of training unfortunately, has been so narrow. We've, we've thought in the formal side of things that that's training. Well, formal learning initiates training. It starts the learning process. Correct. Yeah. But experience is developed in the flow of work. And expertise requires experience. <laughs> and so that experience happens in the flow of work. 
So if we can't step into the flow of work and support people as they accommodate all of the different challenges at the moments of apply, solve, change, and even learn new and learn more in the flow of work, if we can't accommodate that, then we're very shallow in how we support real learning and skill development and the development of expertise in the flow of work. And one of our earlier articles was how, at the time we called it performance support, but how performance support saved the classroom. Yeah. And as, as I watched the classroom mature, as I grew up in technology in particular, technology got harder, more sophisticated, more things. People had less time to learn it. And so classes became these overburdened, overtaught places that people left hair blown back and eyes glazed over. And, and many, anything but prepared to perform. This is such a freeing model to that brilliant tool we have, formal instruction, to let it really do what it does best and let a gifted instructor be what they can be. I think they still leave that way, Bob, but they just have support <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> but thank goodness for the safety net, right? All the more reason. Right. I mean, Sue, all the more reason to have a digital coach. My gosh. I mean, right? When we do RWAs, the content and tasks needed today to survive and the rate at which it changes is absurd. So without, how do we sleep at night without a digital coach in the background knowing that it can save the day, you know, when people perform? So you guys, we're making a big deal of this thing. We're making a huge deal of this thing. So is this something you got to go out and buy? I mean, is it, is, it, is it something I have to go to that extreme? Is there such a thing? And what do I get for that? And, and what about those who say, Con, you brought this up earlier. No, 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 I have, we have SharePoint. We have, we have already have performance support. We, we've got a content repository. We've got teams. Microsoft has told us we have, we already have performance support. And I'm not, by the way, knocking Microsoft per se, but, but this is, I think, tipping the side of the misunderstanding of the, the, the nature of what the tool itself needs to be. What's your reaction to the buy versus build or I already have that. I've got content around my company. Well, again, it's all about the methodology, right? The degree in which you're able to orchestrate the resources in the way that you need to and deliver them in the way that you need to. And so when we look at it, you can build a digital coach using all kinds of technology. There, there are software systems that are built especially for developing a, a digital coach and maintaining it and scaling it out in the way that we need to. And those are important to know and to understand, but that's not where you have to begin. You can begin very simply uh, using the technologies you have, but you have to understand what is it that functionally that digital coach needs to do. It needs to be able to provide two clicks, 10 seconds access to a, a task level support, to the steps of a task, and my ability to look at those steps in a a high level and a detailed way. And then I, for that task, I've got to be able to get to all of the reference resources that I could use that are relevant to help me be able to perform, continue to perform using those reference resources like a job aid or a checklist or other kinds of things. But then I might also need some training. So I need to get to training or learning resources and then ultimately people resources. But those are orchestrated in a way that helps me intuitively get to what I need to get to. And as long as you're doing that, you can do that in SharePoint if you're wise enough and work with it in the ways that you need to. Asu has been a genius. So I'm going to turn my time over to her here, my words, and let her continue because she has done this on many different platforms. So Sue, take it away. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I would say there's an upside and a downside to everything, right? There are trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And so you need to decide what is it, first of all, what do you have? And like Khan said, it's all about the design, really. So you can make SharePoint work as a digital coach. You can make a PDF work as a digital coach. Really, so for me, my advice is to start where you are with what you have start building things. And as you know what you need, then you can start looking and say, you know what, I really need something else. If you don't have the luxury of going right out and, and right away buying performance support software, oftentimes organizations just need to start with what they have 
and and I would just piggyback on what Khan said. It's all about the design. So Sula, let me ask you a question. There, there was just recently an article published by a, a dear colleague of ours, and she does this every year about the top 100 tools that we are using in learning. There isn't an EPS on there. Not one. Didn't make the top 100, which is really troubling to me because recently there's been multiple reports that have come out of many different associations that workflow learning embedded stuff is top of mind. Mm -hmm. in L&D right now and in the business right now, and yet we won't buy the hammer to drive the nail. So when we say EPSS authoring tool, so you've worked extensively in, in the store-bought ones, mm -hmm. what, makes them, what makes them not SharePoint when you've worked in these tools? What do you get for that, taking that extra step and making that commitment? They're designed right out of the box to be able to support the pyramid. So you get in, and you get to the content that you need without having to dig through a whole lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some software out there that people like to think of as a digital coach because it walks you through how you do a task, but that's walking you through how to do a task. It's not, it's not a digital coach. It's not providing that context. It's not providing the additional orchestrated resources and supporting knowledge as well. It kind of takes us into maintenance, in my opinion. Um, yeah. What have you found with, with that, you guys, about, we often think about, the up, about everything leading up to the build or everything leading up to the delivery. And in training mindset, we think about versions. And so I've got three more months till my next one, and I'll make the corrections and such between. Well, we all know that in the workflow, you may have days, minutes, hours before your next version. Content maintenance, user-generated content. Speak to that as a discipline and, and also, Sue, maybe even speak to it from the standpoint of the tools you just mentioned. Is that an, an upside, these kinds of commitments and things? I think so, because with the performance support software, generally it's designed to be able to point to existing resources. You can deep link into things that are maintained by the groups that actually own them instead of being maintained by the learning and development team. We don't have to update our e-learning course because this interface changed or whatever. So I feel like the maintenance is, is easier. Hmm. Yeah, this is both maintenance and measurement are two issues that, that ultimately push organizations as they invest more and more into the world of a digital coach and using that capability to do all that can be done. Goodness. Keeping content current, keeping, uh, as you mentioned, Sue, resources where they are and brokering into those places where there is a pathway of keeping content current, knowledge management systems, so forth, is so important. And that's generally in the journey of maturity. At some point, organizations begin to look at technologies designed specifically Mm. for a digital coach. And why not? In, in reality, we have software for developing e-learning. We have software for managing our libraries of, of learning. You know, where things are important, we have software that helps us build and design and develop and deliver. We certainly need to have that for a, something so important and powerful as a digital coach. You know, and, and content management's come back in, in vogue. Yeah. I mean, it was LCMSs and other kinds of things were, were big uh, years ago and kind of lost favor or took a, took a backseat to other things we were doing. But governance becomes a big deal because so much of this discipline is not about the initial build. It's about keeping things current and by whom, Sue, to your point, and where are they kept? This is a whole other level of this discipline of governance and content management that we I don't know if ever gone as deeply into as this discipline will force you to become. Yeah, and in addition to keeping things current, there's also the ongoing optimization of a digital coach and the other uh, resources that, that we're using or employing you know, to support performance in the flow of work. We have to keep it vibrant and meaningful, and that requires ongoing optimization as well as maintenance of the solutions we build. Guys, I think part of what has bitten us back is the legacy of EPSS. 
even calling it a digital coach has the word digital in it. So too often we're myopic about its application. And the first thing that comes to mind, and I agree it's low hanging fruit is, well, IT systems. We can embed this in, you know, we had Clippy back in Word or we can, we RoboHelp came along for a while and those current systems, WalkMe and others now that have these, to your point, Sue, these wonderful recording capabilities and, simu- and that type of deal. So there has been a bias in our industry that this is only IT skill focus, which by the way, is a tiny sliver of the training that and performance that we have to support. What's your opinion on soft skills? Is a digital coach only for digital stuff or IT alone? What about the whole world of talent management, development, leadership, sales skills, product knowledge, none of which are maybe at all tied to any kind of system? Can they support those domains as well? Absolutely. 80% of the work we do jumps into the world of, of soft skills. In reality, every job has procedural skills and And what we call soft skills are principle-based skills that are outside of technology. And today, uh, work is so sophisticated that many people are going into technology, then out of technology and doing work that has nothing to do with technology, and then back into another different kind of technology, and then out of that to do other uh, human interactive kinds of things that have nothing to do with technology. And so... This mix of soft skills, you know, hard skills, if you want to call it uh, procedural, and then in and out of technology, that's the nature of work today for so many. And you can't just paint yourself into the corner of a technology-based delivery of a digital coach that is tied to the software and other things. It's got to be able to live in and out of that technology. So, Sue, when you've done your work in soft skills, how do you get people to think task-based in that? Unfortunately, we called it soft skills for a long time. So the natural inclination is it's too abstract. How do you get to the procedural level of that stuff? Because there are still things that you need to do. And so you need to focus on what is it that you need to do? And then with soft skills, I think a lot of times there's more supporting knowledge that goes with it but there are still things that I'm going to do. There's a reason why I want to uh, become a better leader or, you know, something like that. There's, there is a performance there that I can look for. Yeah. It's so funny to me when folks say, well, leadership, that soft skills, you can't build performance support for leaders, you know, and I'm going, so what do they do? They just sit around all day and think about leadership. I mean, leaders in all jobs, in all work, there are things that we do. And if we're doing, acting in any way, that is performance. And performance can be documented and supported. You know, it's just principle-based versus procedural-based tasks. We've never in this journey been asked to, (laughs) to build a digital coach for a performance area that we haven't been able to do it. So you guys, let's, let's wrap with this. So when you set us up for this earlier, all of what we discussed is a mindset shift from either the deliverable we build, i.e. the technology, the tool we use to design in, like a EPSS software, the, the framework you guys have continued to discuss, the pyramid and so on. For years, we've been wired around other things. ILT, e-learning, lessons. We, we think these things first. If we're going to get to a digital coach is deliverable, we have to be in the mindset of that being the bullseye. In, in your two journeys, how have you helped or how did you personally make that flip? I mean, Sue, you were completely immersed in our earlier careers and together. Yeah. You, yeah. We, were, we worked for a training company and wrote curriculum That was for stand-up. You ran a department in that and were brilliant at that too. How did you get to where you are today uh, in yours and con your journey as well? So for me, Bob, it was that curriculum line that we developed called LearnPro, where we did flip learning upside down and we did start to think about it as what do people need to do? And it was more problem-based, scenario-based learning 
And so that I think set the stage for me to make this shift. Mm -hmm. But it was a really a big deal because we had to come up with the what is the higher level thing that somebody is trying to do and what are the what are the tasks that fall underneath that? And it was not an easy shift. I was used to starting the other way. Yeah. Yeah. My 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 shift happened in 1984, as you know, Bob. It, it's when I left graduate school and entered the real world of work. And I asked myself a question that changed my entire professional career. And that was, why am I doing what I'm doing? Training is a means to an end. So what is the end? What is it that I am doing for the organization that has hired me? And I realized that it was to enable effective performance on the job, that training was a means to that end. It wasn't to be able to think about what they do, but to actually do, perform effectively. And obviously that requires knowledge, but it requires more than that. And that turned the whole methodology, the all that I had learned in graduate work and all that I had done in my graduate work came into a different focus. It flipped it, as, as you said, Sue, it flipped it on its head and I've never looked back. It's been about performance ever since and that changed the whole methodology of how we go about instructional design. A performance first approach to instructional design is very different than what you do when you're designing for an academic environment. Yeah, I mean, the, I remember the first time, Con, I watched you do an RWA, and I was like mortified and and mesmerized all in the same at the same time because it, it showed me something very quickly, and that was that I was pivoting on the wrong thing out of the shoot. All right, I was getting smeeze in a room and having them tell me what people should be told to ultimately do. But if you look at the order of operation of that sentence, it really is that it is flipped the other way. And I, as you work through that day, I thought, holy cow, I have no clue about the workflow that those I teach return to. None whatsoever. Even though I sat with SMEs for five days telling me what they did or what they thought was important. But that's not the workflow. That's not designing for performance back. And when you see that, you realize, holy cow, I better put something in that workflow for them to survive it because training alone is never going to get us there. You know, I wrote an article years back called, Do We Teach Swimming or Prevent Drowning? And my pivot was, if you saw someone drowning, would you start doing PowerPoints? Would you do a, do a what's in it for me? Would you say, no, no, look over here, watch me model swimming so you can get to the side? No, of course not, you'd throw them a life jacket. You, you give them something in the context of that situation to survive the moment. And when time, you teach swimming. That's exactly the, the model you folks did earlier. And a digital coach is the tip of the sword of that and the tool we have to begin building first. So friends, brilliant as always. Appreciate your time, your expertise. We hope this has been helpful for others. Sue and Khan, thanks so much as always for your insights. And uh, we'll continue to talk more about this. Cool. Thank you. Take care, friends. Thank you. Well, that's it for this episode of the Five Moments of Need Performance Matters series. We look forward to future conversations around how to best put the five moments of need into practice. We welcome your feedback and can be reached on Twitter using my Twitter handle at BMOSH, as well as our Five Moments of Need website, which is www.5momentsofneed.com. We hope you're finding these helpful and we'll subscribe to future episodes. Have a great day, friends.